Okay, welcome all. Uh, let me uh, do the speaker view right off. I have just two quick announcements. One is the result of one of your fellow students coming up with a very good suggestion for extra credit, which is in line with what I already was offering, but more specific. Okay, I hate the lighting in this stupid office, but anyway, the place I have to be because of my evening class in Anley Hall, that's where I am now. Um, okay, so uh, one of your fellow students suggested that I give you guys a short list and I've already thought it through, so I don't need to have it written down. However, you know, if you wanna write these things down or just then replay, of course you can on YouTube after 8 p.m. Friday, the beginning of this video for a short list of movies that I guarantee if you have any interest in the artists. Um, yeah, yeah, that was, it was John's idea, yeah. Um, to to supplement or, or, or further um, flesh out, I'll call it, the option of watching movies about the life of an artist. Well, having done that my whole adult life and mentioning that to every class I ever taught in art history going back since, what, 25 years now I've been teaching here, I've always recommended them. I used to show, I show clips when we had, believe it or not, a VCR machine. Yes, in the 90s, we'd roll it into the classroom. But of course, the screen was so small, students would have to gather around it in front of the room to see. <laughs> anyway, things are much easier now. So these are all, I double check, all these movies are available on either Amazon and or Netflix. So here we go. Number one, I would almost give this in order of, well, they're all good. I can't say one's better than another, but I have a preference for the best movie I've ever seen about the life of an artist. It'll tug at your, I don't hate to say tug at your heartstrings, that sounds so cliche, but it's definitely an emotional roller coaster. It's about Van Gogh, it's the best movie ever made. There have been dozens made about him. And it's the first movie ever made about him. It's called Lust for Life. And you may be surprised if you know who the actor who played him was, that he deserved the Academy Award. He was nominated, but passed over by uh, the Academy for someone else. It was called, uh, I mean, he, he is, name of the lust i'll say it again three words lust for life the artist and he was an artist <laughs> the actor who should have gotten the academy for portraying him was kirk douglas who just died at 105 or something amazing guy He's, his career spanned like you know three generations in hollywood he fought the blacklist when it wasn't popular it could have ruined your career you know the anti-communist blacklist you heard of that some of you pretty rem uh, remarkable guy and all the way from playing Spartacus to Van Gogh what a range but you'll forget you're watching Kirk Douglas within a few minutes because he really just brought that role to life and it's based on a Pulitzer Prize winning novel which is a slightly fictionalized version but mostly accurate like 90 percent of what's in the movie literally happened the way the movie portrays it based on that book which is also called lust for life so you you might want to read the book but for the extra credit you just need to watch it's exactly two hours it's beautifully filmed it won several academy awards including a supporting actor for the man who played Gauguin uh and uh a number of other actors uh, i mean sorry the director i think and i know that the soundtrack the music to it is beautiful and the cinematography. That's what matters in a film about a painter. So that is the number one recommendation. Lust for Life about Van Gogh. Okay, the next one I would uh, mention would be uh, Moulin Rouge, or if you're from Indiana, Moulin Rouge is my aunt from Kokomo used to call him. She knew all about the artist. She just couldn't pronounce foreign people's names. But Moulin, M-O-U-L-I-N. We talked about this. It was a slide we saw at uh, one of the nightclubs. The word means nightclub, and as well as windmill in, in French. Moulin Rouge mean red windmill, red windmill nightclub. It's the most famous night. That's where the can-can was invented and where Toulouse-Lautrec did most of his most famous paintings. And that's what this movie is called. Moulin Rouge with Jose Ferrer, who walked on his knees the entire film for months. It, it's amazing he didn't end up crippled. He won. The, he did win the Academy Award for portraying Toulouse-Lautrec. That movie is an amazing emotional experience, not to mention the artwork throughout it. These, these are films that had permission from the artists and their, their estates, you know, their, their descendants or the museums that own their work to use the original images. That's one reason I recommend them. And it'd be easy to write two pages about what you learned. So again, the second movie I would recommend is 
Don't mix it up with the later version with uh, Nicole Kidman. Nah. I mean, that was, you know, mildly amusing, but nothing accurate in it, <laughs> except, you know, John Leguizamo. Some people felt that was a deliberate <laughs> name game that they chose him with that last name to portray to lose the trick. Don't waste your time watching that. I, I, I don't think I'd give you credit. It, it's not at all accurate. But Moulin Rouge is very accurate portrayal of the career, life, and tragic <laughs> history of Toulouse Lautrec. Okay, the third um, one. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, what was it? so I don't so we don't get it confused. Can you repeat it more time? What was the? They're what's both the, called Moulin Rouge. Rouge. Just don't waste your time watching the nineteen. No, what the hell was it? Two thousand five. Not watch the original 19. It's 54 that far back. It's probably the first serious movie made about the life of an artist in the United States. I think so, Thank because uh, Lust for Life was 56. I know. I mean, I, I wasn't even old enough to watch these movies. I was a tiny little tyke when they came out, but they used to be on TV once a year. And my dad would have us, me and my older brother that were both interested in this kind of movie, watch them, you know, on our then black and white TV. <laughs> But in color, they are dynamite. I mean, the cinematography in both those movies. So again, Less for Life, 1956, Moulin Rouge, the original version, 1954. Then the next best one is, they're not really ranking them, uh, would of course uh, be Frida with Salma Hayek. What a tour de force about her and of course her husband, right? It's a powerful movie. It's mostly about her, but it also, uh, has, you know, uh, Diego Rivera's art in it as well as hers, but mostly focuses on her. And it's absolutely accurate because they got permission from the family descendants and the museums in Mexico City, which I have been to more than once where her art is, but most famous paintings are, are kept. So some of them are in, there's one in San Francisco at the Museum of Modern Art. They had their honeymoon in San Francisco. So that's another option. Of course, you always have had, there's nothing new from, for that. You can go to any art museum. Uh, okay, so that's, just Frida, just the title, I don't remember what year it is. It's sometime in the aughts and it won several cat awards. The next one um, I would recommend is uh, Surviving Picasso, which was uh, based on the book, uh, it was a book, I believe, memoir and actual published autobiography of his daughter, whom I met once in San Francisco at an architect's office. Uh, I think her name is Paloma Picasso. She went into fashion line and things. So, but she was the daughter of the only uh, woman who married Picasso and left him instead of the other way around. He always left the women involved in his life and then would come back for emotional game playing. He was not a decent person in terms of the way he treated women. There's nobody debates that. I even put a piece on um, an, a website called wildkelt.com. Now the tip for extra credit, five points. You could just download that you don't have to print it out or even just read it on wildkelt.com, Picasso's women. I wrote it about how he treated women, but the one who got away and was not willing to let herself be abused wrote the memoir that the movie is based on. Again, it's surviving Picasso and Anthony Hopkins nails the world of Picasso. Again, you think you're really watching the real Picasso. That was probably around 2000. It's the only one with that title. And then the, the last one, uh, is older than, well, no, it isn't older than, it's, it's, it's a while ago, and it's called uh, The Agony and the Ecstasy. It's about the, the truth. Now, it is accurate in most regards. It's one, okay, let me let this person in, uh, which is about Michelangelo's experience creating the um, Sistine Chapel paintings, what he went through to create them. And yes, Charlton Heston, <laughs> I know, he, he was, when he rose to the, uh, the challenge, he could be a very good serious actor. He didn't always just grimace and run around in an ape suit like in Planet of the Apes. Uh, I mean, whatever, loincloth. Um, this role, actually, that's not a bad movie either. But in this one, um, you absolutely, again, think you're watching Michelangelo. And uh, Rex Harrison, who's one of the great British actors, played the Pope who forced him to do it. It's a well done movie based again on a Pulitzer Prize winning novelized history. That's what they used to call them, where 90% of everything is correct. The one thing they got wrong, just as a tip, is they made out him to his Michelangelo, as though he had a romantic relationship and maybe implied an intimate one with a, a high ranking woman, noble woman. He had friendship with him, but many historians think he was gay. He could have been 
you know, by or not, but he'd never actually indulged in any intimate relationship that we have concrete evidence of. So that's the one thing that's a little off base, but hey, the movie is 1964, the exact 400th anniversary of his death. And it starts with a 10 minute summary of his, of his work. And it, that alone is worth watching the movie. It's called The Agony and the Ecstasy with um, Rex Harrison as the Pope. And uh, as I just mentioned, right, Charlton Heston is my client. So those are five of the best movies about artists, and you can find them all online. Okay, let's get started. Um, by the way, I did make this announcement. I'm going to rehash everything I said on Monday. Uh, but uh, if you haven't gotten a grade yet from your midterm, or if you turned in a paper and somehow didn't get it back yet, it's because I never saw it, because it went astray somehow. I've said that and I've actually gotten two people submitting or resubmitting with evidence that they did originally send something on time. They, who knows why? I don't know and I don't care. I do care about you guys not having a problem that's not of you know your making in any way about uh, submitting something that you should get credit for. After all, you do the work, you should get the points. And I will grade those quickly. It's you know within 48 hours after I get them in my inbox. But that's just a heads up to anybody who has you know, knows they turned in either the paper or the first paper we're talking about. Obviously, the exact paper is due in two weeks. Uh, or or the, well, actually, it's two and a half weeks. It's two weeks from Monday. Uh, or, or the midterm, which there were still, I think, two or three people out of the 35 that logged on that day, the midterm, that I never got the, the test from. So if you know for sure and you can prove it, you do have to show me a screenshot of the original date and time you sent the assignments in. I will count it and no points off either the, the first paper, but that's not that's not going to apply to more than a couple of people, but just for those it might be relevant. Okay, let's get started. We have a lot to cover and it's really juicy stuff, <laughs> as one of my teachers used to say. Um, okay, so let's get rid of this. We're going to start with Degas, and this is the first must know. We're looking at it right now, so here we go. Um, okay, Degas, I'm sure most of you know how to spell his name, but it's uh, D-E-G-A-S. This is called the dance class, just like it sounds, the dance class, 1875. Degas was one of the founding members of the Impressionist movement. Now, what that means is he was, A, one of the first Impressionists, the first artists to adopt this style. I already defined Impressionism last uh, on Monday last lecture. So you, de you definitely want that if you weren't here. And the majority apparently <laughs> are choosing just to log on. I guess that's your option. Those who aren't here today uh, will have to watch the video on Friday or whenever after 8 p.m. that they choose. You definitely need to know that definition. It will come up in more than one way. The definitions of both uh, Impressionism and uh, English uh, realism. Okay, uh, which I gave in class on Monday. So this is an Impressionist style painting, but Degas had three, and that's the first and most important part of the meaning. Well, first that he was one of the earliest Impressionists. That's a fact if it appears on the essay part of the final. You can mention that, but the other facts are what made him unique or, or distinct from other Impressionists. And there were three, the phrase signature motifs, I've used it before, I'm sure. And that's a really a good phrase. You don't have to use it to get an A on the, on the essay parts of the uh, final, but it's a useful term. You know, individual techniques that, that were associated with a specific artist. His three main signature motifs are, first of all, a mixture of realistic and impressionistic details or sections, let's say sections, in each of his paintings. Sometimes he did purely impressionist paintings, but he never did strictly realistic. So what parts of this painting are realistic and not impressionistic. These two girls, especially the one that's closest to us with the red flower in her hair, her upper body, at least her back, her arms and hair are more realistic than impressionistic. And so is the instructor. He was a famous dance teacher who had once been a dancer himself and uh, you know had a long waiting list of people wanting to get it. And then this girl too, at least her, you know, upper, again, her upper body, her hand, her hair, her face, they, they both look kind of spoiled and bored, don't they? And so they're the closest to the viewer. So their upper bodies are realistic as is the instructor. Everything else in here is, uh, well, actually her legs, maybe. Yeah, 
but everything else, the floorboards, the walls, the mirror, that is a mirror, and all the other dancers plus their dresses are all impressionistic. So that's your first thing that's your motif to look for uh, that uh, is what distinguishes Degas from other impressionists. Another is the oblique angle. And if you're gonna write that on the exam, I hope you'll spell it correctly. It's not O-B-L-E-E-K, it's O-B-L-I-Q-U-E, of course, oblique angle or extreme and diagonal um, perspective. Well, we saw, remember that with Japanese prints like uh, Hokusai and some of the others, the first one about the uh, prostitute and, and the young woman next to her um, in the harbor of Tokyo. Uh, when we cover Japanese art from the 1700s. So the Japanese, and then some would say they invented the oblique angle and Degas gave credit to that. He said he was inspired by looking at Japanese prints. You can see that just obviously this is not your typical angle. Most painters would have painted a direct view, you know, standing behind these two girls with a straight rectangular, you know, room, you know, receding into the distance, or or maybe from here, looking at the side wall, you know, with the dancers evenly spread across left to right. That's not the case here. This is a very dramatic diagonal uh, sight line, or the right word is oblique angle. And he did that with almost all his paintings. And the third thing that distinguishes his uh, style or types of impressionist uh, paintings is that his topics, his themes were almost always performing artists, dancers, racehorse jockeys, musicians, singers. He loved to paint, you know, in action, you know, or in motion, performing artists of all kinds. That was like over 90% of his work, the, just say the vast majority of his paintings are uh, depicting uh, performing artists in, in action. Well, here they are, they're dancing, of course, and learning, hopefully for some of them to be good enough to be you know, on the stage. Um, so that marks this as a Degas type painting. And then the other thing about him you could add uh, as a fact of the meaning is that he befriended Mary Cassatt. We're gonna talk about her too in just a couple more slides. Very important artist. One of the few American Impressionists during the Impressionist movement, very few Americans even knew about Impressionism that she came to Paris. So he befriended her and invited her to join the Impressionist movement. If it weren't for him and their friendship, they, she might not be known today as well as she is. But she also promoted his paintings in America too. So they had a mutually beneficial friendship. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much, you know, and you know what Impressionism is because I gave the definition Monday, I don't have to repeat that. This, this qualifies as a, classic example of about 80% or 90% of the, of the entire scene is impressionistic, just as the details of these two women are more realistic at the far uh, left side. Okay, let's do our formal analysis. Is it balanced? Well, if you count the floor as mass, well, it is. I would call it balanced, but I can see why if you felt, in, as you glance it over, if it's on the final, that the bodies of the dancers have more weight in the wall, maybe, you might think of it as uh, unbalanced then perhaps towards the top if you do the line here. But then, you know, most of this dancer's body is below the midline and most, or at least half of the instructor plus the whole floorboard. So it's a, how do you see it? I, I definitely would have to say it's unbalanced toward the left because of the size of the two uh, dancers' bodies closest to us. Okay, the rhythm is so obvious, the floorboards, right? the dancers arms legs heads and of course their tutus that's the right phrase and then the wall the cement texture is mostly uh, implied because there's no realistic cement texture except on the three areas the backs of these two closest dancers to the viewer their upper bodies we just want to say it that way and then the the, the clothes at least and well the whole body including the head of the instructor those have realistic cement texture everything else is is implied to make a texture and soft or diffused. Remember that's D-I-F-F-U-S-C-D, not D-E-F-U-S-C-D, diffused modeling. Now that's true just about everywhere, again, except where the modeling is strong and realistic on the backs of those two girls. Okay, there is line here. It's, it's a soft line, but it's there as outlined on the floorboards and on his body. 
and the upper bodies of these two. But everything else, there's no line here. In most impressive paintings, there's no line at all. Line is outlined. So it's, it's minimal, but it is present on those parts that are realistic. Cool green and blue colors on the wall, a cool grayish color on the floorboards. And their dresses, of course, are all cool. Uh, the different shades, of course, of uh, sashes, but obviously some green cool ones and then red and yellow and some details, but all the skin tones are warm. But so most of the colors here are cool. It's both stable and dynamic. She's stable, definitely. He is stable. The wall is stable. But the diagonal line makes the floor look dynamic. And most of the dances in the back, middle or background are, you know, in motion. So they're dynamic. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the heads, arms, hands, legs. Um, for space, here you have the main techniques, but no atmospheric perspective. There's scientific perspective. There's no question he used the vanishing point in this in most of his paintings. And of course, it's got foreshortening, overlapping, and diminishing size. Okay, I think I've got, oh, and the largest mass, I'd, I'd say it's the floor, the floorboards, or just the floor, actually. And then it's probably the wall, if you count that as a single mass. Uh, and then it would be the closest dancer. Okay, this next one is really where I like to ask people for their knowledge, if you have any of you experience with this particular alcoholic libation okay it's called the glass of absinthe some of you know what that is you may even have tried it as i have in paris it used to be impossible to get in america but now it's legal here too a b s i n t h e of course they got i did i say that they got the glass of absinthe 1875 this is not typical of his work it addresses the social you could say condition. I wouldn't say ill or evil, although it qualifies as that in some people's minds. It's just a slice of life, the French have a phrase, a vignette, you know, a little scene from everyday life, but it's a sad one. No question, he meant us to feel sad. Why? Well, let's see what the clues tell us. So there's no right or wrong here. So what it is, you may or may not. But let me start by asking, does anybody here know what absinthe is or what's in it? is different than most alcoholic drinks? Anybody? Uh, never had it, but I believe it's an alcoholic drink that actually has some ingredients that actually aren't good for you. Yes, that's absolutely true. Poisonous in too big a quantity. You could even- Wasn't, wasn't that originally from the barrels though? They use like wormwood or something and that's what was partially yeah. poisonous? That, that's interesting. I didn't think about the feral connection. I've heard that, but I've forgotten about it. I was thinking of the fact, yes, you, you ex, excellent, both, both of you are right. Um, wormwood is a poisonous substance that can give you, uh, in small quantities, hallucinations. Yeah. And in some quantities, it can uh, do brain damage, and, and if you take too much, it can kill you. So it was illegal in this country for, for decades. I think, you know, generations after it was uh, illegal in, in France, but then it was outlawed in Europe too in the early 1900s. It is now legal and more controlled. So the quantity of wormwood or the poison and substance in it. But anybody know what it tastes like? Nobody's tried it? Yeah, it's like licorice -y. Yes, licorice flavored. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> alcoholic drink. Very, I think it's like 40%. Proof. Yeah, uh, but it's cool because like they make it differently. Usually like right in front of you with the little like sugar drip thing or... In Paris, yeah. You buy it. yeah. At Lotel, did you go to Lotel in uh, Paris? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I was just on the left bank, and I was with French friends, and you know, they said, "Let's try this." I don't think you can. It's back in the '90s, so it's a while ago. Anyway, you can get it here now, but I'm not recommending you try it. That would get me fired. No, that's uh, not if, right. if, if you're if you're legally of age, that's your choice. But let's just say that it, it it could be abused easily. It could be harmful. We absolutely concur in that so what's going on here anybody guess take a look at the expressions on the faces this is a couple or are they really but they are together they arrive together at least look at her face look at her body language her slumping shoulders and then look at him look at his eyes and how his body language is not in the same plane as hers anybody want to summarize what's probably going on here or at least what she might feel and or what he might be thinking I think the clues are defeated. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I I say that they kind of look defeated, kind of like well, there's, there's nothing. 
She does, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For what reason, can you guess? Well, look at his face and look at his body language. Is he? Maybe they they don't like each other. Like maybe yeah. their relationship. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, finish. <laughs> oh no, it's just kind of. It's, it just seems like she doesn't want to be here. Yes, know, like, right. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you've heard the phrase. Sometimes you can be more alone in a relationship than on your own. Um, in any case, this is a dysfunctional couple. But just to complete that aspect of the meaning, anybody guess what he's thinking about or looking at or doing? Another woman. Yeah, maybe. not the menu. Yes, clearly. He, in other words, this is beyond just a you know slightly estranged couple or a couple that just had a fight. He obviously is not there for her and probably hasn't been for a long time. And she not only knows it, but yeah, defeated is not a bad word. Depressed, you could say it that way. She's depressed or disillusioned. And yes, she would like to get out, but unfortunately she hasn't yet gotten the courage or strength to do that. So instead she's taking, some people call it liquid courage, right? With this drink, there it is, the glass of absinthe. It's a green, you know, they call it the green goblin is a nickname in English for that because it has a green color. As some of you know, the ones who said you tried it, right? Yeah, it's actually quite tasty, but uh, it can be habit forming. So it's uh, somewhat risky. That's why it was outlawed here besides having wormwood. So what we have is an, an empty bottle. That's, she's, they probably, well, he looks like he's drinking beer. So she's, she's actually the one drinking the stronger alcoholic libation because she's trying to forget or just, you know, uh, self-medicate. That's another phrase you could use. So it's it's a it's a very uh, toxic relationship, and she's the unfortunately the um, one that's being you know abandoned. Let's say emotionally at least, even though they may live together. So he captured this scene at some point in his mind. He might have sketched it. I don't know if historians have any evidence of that, but undoubtedly, you know, you walk around Paris, you see life everywhere you go. That just cries out for some kind of image. So that's why painters moved to Paris still today and some stay and live for, for years, even if they're not French. Uh, it's an incredible, it's my favorite city in the world. Absolutely no other place like it. Uh, life just, you know, and all it's good and bad and happy and sad and uh, inspiring and depressing aspects is just everywhere around every corner. So he, he probably saw a couple like this. There are other historians who think that he paid these two uh, models to just you know, go through the motions and pretending to be an unhappy couple. It's hard to know, but it doesn't matter. Either way, he undoubtedly saw more than once, I'm sure, as he lived in Paris, Degas lived in Paris. So he saw some scenes, maybe more than one, one couple, where the, this was their, the nature of their relationship. He's captured it brilliantly here. So it has the oblique angle, the last part of the meaning that we know is one of his signature motifs. And here I'd say that the, the, the bottle itself and her face are the two realistic details. It's typical of him mixing, you know, or it's close to being, and certainly her face is, right? I mean, that's not impressionistic at all, her hair, her eyes, but everything else is pretty much impressionistic. But then this doesn't fit the third signature motif. These are not performing artists, <laughs> not any way I can imagine. Okay, so let's do our formal analysis. It's very well balanced with her right in the middle and these two tables, you know, meeting roughly in the dead center of the painting. Now it's true, their two bodies might make you think it's weighted. If you do, I wouldn't dispute it over towards the right, but I, this is solid back here. The mirrors, yes, many French bars have mirrors. Uh, and then the wall and this, the, t the two tables you can see on the left side, I, I, I'd call it roughly balanced and more of in a diagonal because it's a diagonal perspective line. But if you do it this way, it's definitely balanced. And I would say the same top to bottom. Okay. And we have the rhythm of their bodies, of course, their heads and arms and uh, the wall behind them, the tabletops. And again, we said that this texture is not realistic. Simulated texture here is is almost absent except on her face and maybe the bottle, the empty bottle. Everything else is uh, diffused, as is, is the uh, modeling everywhere, again, except it's sharp and realistic on her face. And I'd say pretty close to being realistic on the bottle, but that, that's borderline. But certainly her face is, what he wants you to focus on is the one realistic detail that is both sharp modeling and uh, uh, strong simulated texture. Okay, and then we have um, the largest mass, what's her? because you can't quite see as much of his body. 
And then I guess it could be the table with the empty bottle, which he kind of wants you to focus on. And then I guess the wall, or you could say the wall behind them, if you count it as one mass, the woodwork and the mirror, then it's that's the largest mass, then her, and then the table with empty bottle. Um, it's mostly stable. I know the diagonal angle makes it look dynamic. So you could say it's both really because of that, the oblique angle. But she's upright. He's mostly upright. The wall behind them is. And of course, in reality, the two tables are and the glasses and bottle and glasses are upright. So I see it's mostly stable, even though their relationship isn't. And for space, you've got foreshortening, of course, overlapping, diminishing size. And I don't think it has scientific perspective, definitely not atmospheric perspective. It's, it's too close up a view. And colors are cool on most of the scene, except for her dress and her face, and then his face. But he his, his attire is entirely cool, as is the green goblin, the glass of absent, the tabletops, the mirror, and maybe just the wood paneling behind them is also warm. So it's a mixture, but more cool than warm. And there is no line here. I don't even see it on her face. A little bit around the bottle, that's right, the empty bottle is outlined. Let's see, around her face, I think. I don't see line here. So it's minimal line, almost no outline. Okay. Now we get to Mary Cassatt, uh, one of the two most important artists in terms of what might be a high possibility of being on the final. Uh, the must know for her, I, I limited it to one because we have so many, you know, artists to cover uh, this week. Um, but it's called The Bath. And I'll go ahead and give you the title. It's this one. It's her most famous painting. Cassatt, C-A-S-S-A-T-T. -S -S the Bath, just like it sounds, 1891. But we have to set up, you know, the meaning requires some context as always. Okay, let's start with, you know, some of you already know this, <clears throat> but if you don't, you should write this. She was the first famous American uh, Impressionist painter. And one of the few, the first famous American Impressionist painter and one of the few American Impressionist painters, period. There were others after her, some of them way after the movement ended. You know, the movement is the group that exhibited together. You understand, the, 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 I gotta make sure it's clear. When I say a movement, I don't mean the entire, concept of Impressionism disappeared overnight or even was abandoned by most of the Impressionists. It just, they disbanded as a group. And so that's what's considered the movement. It lasts about 20 years from the late 1860s to the late 1880s. And then some of them went off in other directions. We'll see that next week with the post-Impressionists. Uh, in this case though, what we have is her joining the actual movement, meaning she exhibited her paintings as Impressionist paintings along with the other Impressionists when they all, once a year, they do a show of their work because no established gallery, let alone museums in France would display their work. Remember they were, I don't know if I use this phrase, I don't think I did on Monday. They were rebels. They were actually revolutionaries. They really were in terms of their style, their artistic techniques because they abandoned so much of the rules of Renaissance realism. I use that term I know on Monday. She did too, but she was more inspired by Degas than any other Impressionist. I've already said, and if you didn't write it before, well, for the meaning of the must-know slides, one slide, sorry, of her it's coming up, of course, the bath, uh, you want to say how she fit into that movement. She was invited to join the Impressionist by Degas, who became a lifelong friend and promoter of her work. Uh, but he just saw her talent. He didn't teach her anything. She learned taught herself on her own. Actually, you don't have to write this, but I think it's fascinating. He met her in the Louvre one day sketching and he could tell that she was a serious artist and talented. And when he saw the work she was doing, uh, uh, some kind of uh, her version of, I don't think they were, they weren't showing in precious painting. So it was some Renaissance painting probably. He could see her talent and he said, have you ever thought about <laughs> the impressionist style? And she said, yes, I've been experimenting with it for years back in America and nobody would buy it. <laughs> So he invited her to join their movement. It's a, it's a nice story and it's very well documented. Okay, back to the facts about what you should have in your notes. All right, so she then joined the Impressionist movement and she adopted two of the three signature motifs that Degas had. One is the oblique angle. Wow, you can see it here. This is called the a Cup of Tea by Mary Cassatt, 1879, I believe it is. It doesn't matter what year because it's not on the syllabus. She moved to Paris in the middle 1870s when the Impressionist movement was at its height and joined it then, 
right away and stayed with it until they disbanded and then kept using Impressionism. So she did two things that Degas had done, which you could say she was inspired by, but you know he didn't tell her to do it or show her. One was the oblique angle, all her paintings have that. I've never seen one that didn't. It's very powerful in this painting. And the other is a mixture of realism and Impressionism like he did. Now that she almost directly took from him. See the teacup and her glove. Those are realistic. Everything else around her, the rest of her body, the chair, the flower pot or whatever you call it is, is all impressionistic. And then she also added uh, geometric motifs in the background, which is a technique of Japanese printmaking that Degas did not do. You see the wallpaper here? This is also called the cup of tea a little later. I think it's 1880. Again, of course, Mary Cassatt. Okay, so it's two friends, American women who married Frenchmen, luckily for them, they got to live there legally and stay as long as they wanted, uh, the, you know, and raise their families there. So they are enjoying who knows what kind of, it might be gossip, we don't know, it's not what the details of the conversation, it's just obviously two friends who are talking about something that is for their ears only, well maybe not if it's a rumor, it's probably going to spread. But they're just enjoying a moment of relaxation in one of their two women's homes in Paris, which is what she did. She didn't marry anyone. She never married. Some say she, she could have married Degas, but there's no evidence of that. They were just lifelong friends, as far as we know. Uh, but she also could not have children. And so that is the third, or well, actually fourth, fourth signature motif of hers. Now, you got the first two, right? Borrow from Degas. Now we're on the must know. Again, the bath, Mary Cassatt. I've already spelled, I think, her name, but I'll do it again. C-A-S-S-A-T-T. -T. This is uh, indicative of or symbolic, you can say, or no, no, an example. Sorry, that's the right phrase. A classic or famous, probably the most famous example of her unique signature motif that nobody else was doing in France or anywhere in Europe or North America. And that is the following. She focused her entire body of work on family life and particularly on children and parents. She couldn't have a child, some medical issue, maybe someday we'll find out what it was, but she, she was not able to conceive. There's no proof that she tried, but there's some evidence she might have. In any case, she never married and she never had a child of her own, but she was a godmother to a lot of families. And that's probably what we see here. Obviously, it's somebody she knew, a friend who has a little, what, about three-year-old girl. This is on our refrigerator magnet, among the other side. She's bathing. That's how they did it. They didn't have indoor bathing. Now we're talking about, and eight, at least in most of Paris, uh, except maybe the very wealthy. Uh, even the White House didn't have indoor plumbing till after the Civil War. And so what we see here is a mother bathing her daughter in a basin or bowl, you could even say, you know, obviously she's going to, you know, take her time and slowly use a washcloth or a sponge to complete the bath. So it's just they're starting out in the evening, probably right before bedtime. And it's a domestic scene that it clearly evokes unconditional love between a parent and a child, or in this case, a mother and her daughter. And that usually is what Mary Cassatt focused on mothers or women raising children with those children in her paintings. Sometimes she'd show, you know, both the husband and wife or father and mother, I should say, uh, in the same painting, but usually it was the mother and she knew these families. Like I said, she was very close to them. Uh, she became famous for that because believe it or not, other painters, well, big surprise, 99% of all the successful painters in Europe and North America then were men. And they didn't think it was that important. Or not that they never painted. I mean, some of you might say, wait a minute, don't I remember? Of course, you've seen paintings of family life by, but it's only of their own family or very close friends that were commissioned as portraits, group portraits. And that's, you know, a tiny sliver of their output. Monet did some family scenes of his own family. And so did many of the other impressions, but they didn't spend their whole career emphasizing it. So at the time, here's the last fact about the meaning. She was not successful in North America. Well, she grew up in Philadelphia, you just see in the US. She couldn't make a living. That's why she moved to Paris because of that fact, as well as the fact that she was a woman. And plus Americans that far back in the 1860s and 70s just weren't 
collecting paintings. And they, within 20 years, they were, but not that far back. So when she moved to France, the Impressionist movement was still uh, radical and experimental. But eventually, she began to sell her paintings and became quite successful. And then eventually famous here in America, too. She painted over a 1,000 paintings of family life, which no one else was focused their entire career on before her. Hey, Mark? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Uh, as I look at this one versus the prior two you shared with us, this one to me looks far more sharp and realistic yeah. versus oh, sure. Sure. especially sure. the first one. So, and it feels a lot less impressionistic yeah, right. than what yeah. I think of. Is this yeah. um I think that's the right is that way. correct or not? Or or um well let me maybe when you do you, the you anticipated the, 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 the actually I'm glad you said that because you have to look at the Back, first of all, the water in the bowl is impressionistic. The rug is impressionistic. All of the background is. So that's how she sometimes chose to do her mixed realism and impressionism. More realism than Degas, in other words. And why? Because she wants us to focus on the people, the family members, the, the, the parent and or parents and their child or children. So the family scene, she would focus on the human figures as realistic. But everything around them is impressionistic. You know, you can see that, right? So, so you're right that, that more than half of it, probably what over two, about two thirds, it's hard to quantify. But the whole background, even including what's in front of the little girl's legs, the water in the water basin, the rug underneath them both, that, that's all impressionistic, but everything on their bodies, and I would include the picture here, uh, is, 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 and even the outer rim of the bowl, but inside it's, it's impressionistic. So it's a mixture still qualifies in that vein, but you're right, it is more, her paintings tend to be a, a more than half of the scene or sections of her paintings would be realistic. And usually she focused that realism on the human figures. And then we have the oblique angle. Oh yeah, it's, it wouldn't work without it. We are, you know, like the father coming in to check on his wife and daughter at bedtime or something, or a family friend, whatever or relative, whatever, visiting. Um, you know, we're standing above them looking down at a very oblique angle. And that's directly comes from the Japanese prints she studied. And then the background is, it, it almost looks like something right out of the Japanese, 18th century Japanese print with the geometric patterns on the rug itself, on the wallpaper, on the dresser. Uh, and then we have the obvious focus on a family life here. Uh, so you see, now this doesn't have she did not do the other thing Degas did, if you're curious. She didn't focus, I already said this, but it's not obvious, on the performing artists. I think she rarely, if ever, painted performing artists. He did almost all from the time. So that's another difference. Anyway, so formal analysis, we've already covered several of the elements. I already covered the survey texture and the modeling, where it's sharp and realistic, but obviously in the two human figures and soft and diffused everywhere else. The largest mass is the mother, then the daughter. Uh, and then it's a close call. I don't know, you could say the rug or the uh, dresser. Here there's line and it's bold outline around the human figures. Uh, and then the warm colors, of course, on their skin tones and almost the entire background is warm, right? But her dress is cool as is the water in the pitcher, in the bowl, I mean, in the water in the bowl <clears throat> and the pitcher. Um, and then we have uh, overlapping and foreshortening here. I don't see diminishing size. Well, maybe on the rug pattern, Guess is minimal, but there's no scientific perspective or atmospheric perspective. Um, it's it's too close up for that. And then we have um, the rhythm, of course, arms, hands, legs, heads, and the geometric patterns. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have let's see, I already mentioned over we forget. Oh, balance. It's it's balance. She usually balances things. You know, this picture roughly balances with the upper body, especially the head of the mother. The bowl roughly with, you could say they're both their heads, and the rug with the background is pretty much equal. And I would argue both ways, top to bottom and left to right. Let's see. Okay, I think that's everything. Texture, modeling, space. Oh, stable or dynamic, sorry. The background is mostly stable, but everything, even including the rug from their heads on down, is mostly dynamic. Okay, that's a that's a not accurate color. By the way, where is this painting? It's at the Art Institute of Chicago, along with a whole bunch you're going to be seeing between now and the end of 
the Art Institute of Chicago, the greatest museum of art in the United States for 19th and 20th century, both American and European paintings. Check out their website and you'll see what I mean. If you ever have a layover of a few hours, take the subway from Ohio or whatever airport you're at, they, they go directly downtown and get off in front of the Art Institute. You'll be right there. And go. Pardon? What museum? Most famous art. It's the Art, I'll say it again, the Art Institute of Chicago, which there is no debating. The French will tell you this. Outside of Paris, it has the best collection of Impressionism and post-Impressionism, but it also has almost all of Picasso's, uh, not almost all, many, just say many of Picasso's most famous paintings, Georgia O'Keeffe's, Edward Hopper, Gauguin, well, I already said anybody. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable collection. You can't see it all at once. And it's one of the most you know, well thought out collections. Why? Because the Chicagoans at that time were Francophiles and or whatever you want to call them, lovers of French art. So they collected Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings before any other wealthy city, you know, um, whatever you want to call them, art uh, collectors. San Francisco, pathetic. I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> pathetic. We have one Van Gogh. <laughs> it's a student knockoff. It's one of his least well uh, detailed paintings. It's sort of a quasi impression. It's a little tiny painting. It's, that's it, the one Van Gogh. There are a dozen Van Goghs, I think it is, at the Art Institute, among others. Okay, let's. Yes, there's a, Jessica. There's, there's an a exhibition on the Sacramento Museum for the masterpieces of impressionism. Oh, you talking about the Sacramento, Sacramento Crocker Gallery? Crocker gallery? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Tell yeah. us again, Jessica. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, either one of you. What's the exhibit called? It's in Sacramento. Great gallery. I love it. I haven't been there in years. The Crocker, as in, you know, the famous banking family. Yeah. It's called uh, the Master uh, Masterpieces of the Impressionist. And it's from, oh. let's say, from oh. Monet to, oh. to Matisse. Yeah, they're on loan. Yeah, they're on loan. And I bet some of them are on loan from the Art Institute of Chicago. Anyway, from Paris. Thank you. Yeah. Massive. So look it up. You look up the Crocker Gallery. You'll see it in that. Now, it's a bit of a trip to get there, but to get the extra credit, you'd have to show me a photo, uh, you know, a screenshot of, you know, a ticket that you actually paid for. It's very reasonable, as I recall. It's not, it's less money than the San Francisco Museums, I think. But whatever it is, is worth it. It's a nice small. $10? It's it was $10 and they oh. it's $10 entrance. And then they have, uh, from Renard, or how do you pronounce it? Like Renard, um, mm -hmm. they have a Monet, and um, one that it's Matisse, but it's very impressive. Yeah, yeah, it is a good collection. And also the special traveling exhibit. Right. Okay, now we need to move, we need, I gotta slow down, to move on to the next artist. And if I, I'm not trying to pick winners and losers or favorites and, not some favorites, but you'd have to say of all the artists we're covering today, the most famous and by far the most famous of all impressionists, at least to Americans, is this man, Monet. Okay, we are going to see two of his, but we'll start with who he was before we get to the must know. This is not the must know. Monet was, I just said, <laughs> first fact about either of the two must know slides coming up. The most famous impressions. He became that. He didn't start out that way. He starved. He literally lived on a boat for a long time because he couldn't afford to rent in apartments in Paris or houses. And he also, his first wife died of a terrible disease. You know, she was ill for a long time. So he had some tragedy and some, um, you know, uh, suffering is the right word, you know, sacrifice, if you want to call it. Um, in his life. Uh, he couldn't sell for a while. Uh, can you believe it? Some of his paintings. Now he lived long enough to see that do complete about face. <laughs> he became the most famous impressionist outside of France, certainly in some would say in the world. Um, because one, he lived to be well into his 80s and kept using that style after most other painters had abandoned it. And because he's one of the first two, remember that's a really important fact about any Monet painting or, or slide that might be on the final. He uh, was one of the first two painters to adopt this new style of impressionism. The other was Manet. Okay, this is a scene by him which was on exhibit for a traveling show that came from, I uh, believe, New York, maybe owns it. It's called the Fet, which is French for Festival of July 14th. It's Bastille Day there. It's their 4th of July, you might say. It's, it's roughly comparable. 
I've been there on Bastille Day and on the 4th of July. By the way, they celebrate the 4th of July in Paris in major ways. Well, you know, without them, we wouldn't have won the Revolutionary War, if you know your history. <laughs> they wouldn't have been able to, or the, the American colonists, to get rid of the British army without the help of French soldiers and Navy. So, yeah, they kind of got us a start in all ways and one. So they, there is a French equivalent, and that's the day they raided the storm the Bastille. It's called Bastille Day. It's their national holiday, one of many, actually. Their most famous one. So this is on Bastille Day in the streets of Paris, a view from the balcony, you don't have to write this, of Monet's studio, an apartment, of course, an apartment with a painting studio. When he lived in Paris for several years, he painted street scenes. That's not what he's known for. He's more well known for his landscapes, of course, and rural scenes. But here we see, isn't it brilliant? I just love this. Look at these flags. I can feel them fluttering. Hear the sound of the flags fluttering in the breeze on a windy day. And I can hear the crowds down below with the you know, bodies of each group. Here's the sunlight between these buildings, you know, hitting the top of this group, but then there, this next group is passing through a shadow. It's, it's really well done. It's classic impressionism done in an urban setting. Okay, but this is the first must go now. So now you need to take notes. Monet, I've already spelled, I'm sure you all know how to spell it. Rouen Cathedral Portal. This is a city, one of my favorite cities in northern France. R O U E N. Rouen Cathedral Portal, three words, 1894. So this, I took this slide. If it's not obvious, you see the frame in the, in the photo. Uh, this one is at the Met in New York, as I would call it. In any case, no matter where it is, you don't need to know that. Uh, if you're in New York, that's the, that's a close second to the Art Institute in Chicago. There, but there are some say equally superb collections. The oldest art museum in New York City, it's the Metropolitan. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking at a classic study done by Monet of, which is what he was famous for, the effects of light on a scene. Remember, that's part of the definition of impressionism. So if this slide is on the exam, you could use that actual definition as one of your six facts or six sentences about the meaning. It's an example of how he, in his own unique, right, interpretation of how light, or impression, I should say impression, of how light affected the scene. So. The subtitle is an equal important detail on the meaning of this. He gave some of these paintings where he did dozens, and I do mean at least two dozen views of the exact same scene over and over. Some people figure that's overkill, but that's how he perfected the techniques of impressionism, starting with his earliest paintings. He's more famous for only certain scenes that are you know, now in textbooks in the museums and so forth. And this is a series on Rouen Cathedral. I'm saying it close to what my French friends tried to teach me how to say the name of that city. He loved this cathedral because it, it happened to catch the light. So the subtitle is part of the meaning of this. So what aspect of light on the front of its cathedral is he capturing in this out of over two dozen views of the exact same scene? This its subtitle is Rouen Cathedral, Summer Light, morning effect. Think about that. That's brilliant. He's telling you this is what the sunlight will do at that time of year and that time of day. So you can probably guess, but it's not obvious. You should probably write this. How did he or why even did he keep doing multiple scenes of the same or paintings of the same scene? Because he would come back to the exact same site and show it at different times of the day and different times of the year. So it would take him at least a year to do any one series. And depending on the weather, he might have to make, you know, anywhere from, you know, a dozen to two dozen trips to that site to keep repainting it at different times of the day and different seasons of the year. So that's why he gave many of his paintings subtitles. And this one, again, if you didn't get, you should have is um, Rouen Cathedral, Summer Light, Morning Effect. Okay, but what really is the final fact about it that isn't obvious to most people unless you've studied Monet's work or impressions in general is look at how many colors there are in the shadows. Well, everywhere, but especially where the shadows show up. It's not just, you know, a darker shade of the pinkish stone or even purplish pink color 
uh, or dark, whatever gray or something that usually would be used in a realistic painting, right? For shadows, you just have some dark color, whether it's dark gray or black or dark brown. Uh-uh, this has a dozen different colors. Look at it. It's got yellow, orange, gold, green, blue, purple, red, which is the way light actually affects a scene. Now, we don't see it that way with our naked human eye. Human eyesight doesn't pick up on that. But science, of course, has already uh, determined by the 1800s, it was already documented that sunlight includes or contains all the colors in, you know, on Earth, let's just say it that way. Uh, and they can be, of course, identified in a scientific experiment, but he knew that from his research and also just intuitively he wanted to portray that. It's his brain. So he painted the same uh, entrance or facade is the right word, facade of this cathedral with the two, sorry, three, three main doors, the entryway, uh, at least two dozen times. And this is just one of those. Okay, formal analysis, it's balanced. But some people consider the sky, though, look carefully, it isn't, it isn't just empty space. It has multiple colors. But if you want to count that, and I wouldn't argue with it as empty space, then you'd say it's weighted somewhat toward the bottom. But it's definitely balanced left to right, roughly balanced left to right. OK, and then you have the rhythm of the pointed arches and the decorative, what little bit there is of the decorative features. You can see, of course, the simulated texture is not present. There is no similar texture. It's implied everywhere. There's no realistic detailing in this painting or most Monet's paintings. Sometimes he makes things, but rarely. And then we have the soft diffuse modeling I've already mentioned in the, uh, the archways, you know, and the doors and so forth. And here there's no line, none, zero, zip, zilt, no line of any kind anywhere in this painting. It's all colors side by side. Color patch revolution, remember, that's the other part of the definition of impressionism. He was one of the inventors of it. Um, and it is uh, dynamic in one sense because it's an oblique angle, the whole painting, but the details on the front of the cathedral, the facade it's called, that's probably the best way to use, but you can say front if you prefer. <clears throat> the facade or front has pointed arches all up and down, like all Gothic cathedrals do. And it's an oblique angle, but yet there's still the stable elements of the upright, you know, tower and uh, walls. For space, all there is is overlapping. This is a flagpole, probably for some reason missing the French flag on it or whatever flag would have been there, <clears throat> but it's clearly overlapping as do, at least as this tower overlaps a bit, the, the, the roof, right? The roof of the church behind you see the little corner of it. So there's a little bit of overlapping, but that's it. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Foreshortening, yeah, you can see that on the, between the far, right and far left end of this facade. So there's foreshortening and overlapping. They're the only two space techniques. Colors, a mixture of warm and cool everywhere. <laughs> Although the sky is mostly cool and the facade of the church is mostly warm, but uh, there actually is a mixture everywhere of, I say, as I point out, warm and cool colors. Um, and let's see, what do we say? The largest mass, I don't think you can break it down. It's just a single mass. Okay, um, did I forget anything? I think that's it. Takes too long and I bounce. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, you have to take notes on this, but this is an example of his. This was also at the Met in Europe, but there's also some at the Art Institute. He did dozens of haystack paintings. And second only to his water lilies, our last Monet. Second is the next painting. Monet must know it's coming up and that's water lilies. He painted that more than any other subject. But he also liked to go out in the countryside and paint different scenes like this is a farm field or farm yard, if you prefer to call it that, with a haystack, typically French, they don't do things the same, right? Their haystacks have shape and form. They're not just blocks of rectangular uh, hay, you know, they, they have these cone shapes, right? Okay, so this is called Haystack, okay. Uh, winter light morning effect. You don't have to write that because it's not on the, 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 the uh, syllabus like the last slide was. But you begin to get the idea here if we move forward, okay, to the same Haystack slightly closer up and at a different time of the year a day. This is called Haystack summer light evening effect. So it's late, late 
after well early evening we should say just before sunset when things are lit up of course by the uh, setting sun it's brilliant it's the same haystack maybe maybe not probably a different haystack same field but we know it's the same field because he wrote about these things he wrote notes about where he was when he painted these paintings so these trees and the hills in the back room and the houses show up in this one too you see that it's the same same field probably just a different haystack but from the same perspective okay this is the next one must know one of the ones that has a high possibility very high probability even of being on the final monet again of course the title is japanese footbridge and water garden japanese footbridge one word and water garden just like this sounds 1899 well this is important to set the scene otherwise it, it won't be uh, clear to you perhaps as to why this is considered classic example of his late work when Monet finally became famous enough to have a national reputation. This is part of the meaning now. I don't know another country that's done this, May maybe in England, maybe, or possibly Italy. The government of France, the national government, gave him an estate of 20 acres with a, they call them chateau, you know, fancy house that they had seized from a tax cheat. <laughs> it was in prison. They took the property, just like the IRS can do here too. So they took, had taken it away from someone who didn't pay their taxes and they gave it to him free of charge. He didn't have to pay anything except the taxes on it. Well, he was earning enough from painting that that meant in essence, he never had to worry about mortgages or rents or, you know, but, you know being able to afford to feed his family. Uh, he had at least several children, I think, by both his first and second wife. In any case, he and his family, and at some point with just him and his wife after his kids grew up, lived on this estate for the last 30-some years, over 30 years of his life. The French government around 1890 gave him the estate. That's, you know, supporting an artist in a unique way that most, most artists never have that luck. But of course, he'd earned it. He'd been near starvation and, and as I said, had a struggle even getting his paintings exhibited for the first 20 years at least of his career. So when he moved to this, it's called Giverny, and you should go ahead and spell that correctly, but no points off if it's on the test, but it's capital G-I-V-E-R-N-Y. It's a place in central France, that's the nearest town, I guess, to this estate. It's open to the public as a national, French national historic site might even be on UNESCO World Heritage. I think it is, yeah, it's that important. He stayed there most of the time after he moved there, only making a few trips to Paris and some other parts of France. But most of the time he just painted all the water lilies gardens and he designed the footbridges there. This is his design, very classically Japanese, what the title tells us, like you'd see all over Japan. Or you can go see it now in the Japanese uh, tea garden next to the De Young Museum and take photos and four photos. Remember, gives you 10 points extra credit for an architecture site. The Japanese tea garden is full of pagodas and it's, you know, tea house where I think you can now, you can buy tea again now that the pandemic is somewhat <laughs> receded. Uh, so you see this kind of footbridge in any Japanese themed garden. So he created several of them. He also did the landscaping. He hired the gardeners. He didn't do the actual planning. Of course, he was trying to create scenes to paint of his own estate. He painted flowers, he painted trees, but mostly he painted water lilies. He loved them. So let's see, what do we see here? We see where the bridge creates shadows during the middle of the day, right? When the sun is, is literally sending its rays to help grow the water lilies on either side of the bridge, but they don't grow underneath because of the shadows. He captures that brilliantly. And yet there isn't a stitch of realism in this painting every ounce, every inch, I should say. Every inch of this painting is impressionist. And then uh, that's pretty much the whole meaning. And you know who he was in terms of his role in the impressionist movement. I already gave you those facts. So let's wrap it up with a formal analysis. And then we have two more muscles and we'll end maybe about 417 or so, 418 at the latest, I promise. Okay, it's balanced. Oh, it's brilliantly balanced. The bridge across the middle, the area of the water lilies or pond, you could say the pond with the lilies and the trees in the background almost equal left to right, top to bottom. It's full of the rhythm that the weeping willow, right? I used to think it is. The bridge railings, the water lilies are what create the most powerful rhythm. 
and there is no simulated texture. It's all implied, but there is soft and diffuse modeling. Again, typical of all uh, truly impressionist paintings. It's dynamic only on the bridge. Everything else is stable. Look at these trees. They're upright. The bushes, maybe a little detail on a couple of the edges of the bushes, but this is, these are upright, mostly the trees and the railings on the bridge, but the bridges, uh, sorry, the uh, post, I meant the railings curve, of course, creates a dynamic line, but it's overwhelmingly stable. The colors, a mixture of warm and cool, like most of his works, right? You see the warm on the water lilies, as well as the cool on the trees in the background, but then when the sun hits them, it creates a yellowish green color. So it's just a mixture. The, the footbridge is entirely cool. And then the largest mass, that's a hard thing to determine, but I would say it's the pond, if you count that as a single mass, the entire pond, if that's one, then the bridge and then the largest tree, the one on the upper left. For space, this does have scientific perspective, atmospheric perspective overlapping and I would say foreshortening on the pond and certainly diminishing size so it's got all the main techniques for space. He's one of those impressions that didn't along with Renoir abandons many of the uh, realistic techniques uh, for, for depth or space in his paintings uh, you know that he'd learned from the Renaissance realist styles that all painters study and still do right here at the JC they still teach those things of course. Okay, let's see, are we missing anything? Um, I think that's it. Oh, there's no line, no line at all. And of course, I already mentioned, oh, it's, yeah, I said it's stable mostly. All right, let's go to our last must know artist. Very important, we have two. They're so important, I'm not cutting either from the study list, at least at the moment, I don't plan to. Rodin, this is, there's two more must knows. Rodin, R-O-D-I-N, or as they say in France, well, da, I cannot say it the way they do. Rod or again, Auguste Rodin, if you're from Indiana, Rodin is close. We need to come. R O D I N, the thinker, 1889. This is at the Rodin Museum in Paris. I took these next two slides, they're my own slides. Most Americans never even know that the museum exists, let alone get there. I have a little anecdote today at the end, it's just 90 seconds, about a famous actor I met there and what he said about that museum. But first, the facts about these two sets. Who was Rodin, the greatest sculptor since the Renaissance, or you can say of the 19th century, if you want to keep it simple, although he, he practiced well into the 20th. So you can just say the most famous and successful, if you want to keep it you know, objective. You know, How do you decide who's the greatest? So the most famous and successful sculptor of his era. He, he worked between the mid 1800s and the early 1900s. You've been to the uh, Legion of Honor, some of you, you walk right by a copy of this sculpture created by Rodin. So it's not a knockoff, it's the real thing. It's an authentic Rodin, it's priceless. So here he has life-size figures done in an impressionistic way. That's why we include him in the topic of impressive painting because he had a technique, this is all part of the meaning that he called malleable, lumps of clay, just like it sounds, malleable lumps of clay. Well, that means that the textures on the bodies of his figures, almost all of them are nude, aren't sharp and realistic. They're stylized. I mean, even the hair, look at that hair. It's like, you know, somebody put clay and slapped it on the guy's forehead. And then the muscles here, they're fairly realistic, but look on his body and his legs particularly. So again, that is a technique, a signature motif that he invented. He's moving, in other words, just like the impressive painters, further away from strict realism uh, that all the sculptors from the Renaissance until his time were, were, were you know, only using realism. And then his other signature motif is the um, rough base, just like it sounds, rough base. That symbolizes our mortality. It symbolizes that we come from the earth and we'll go back to it when we die. It's not a very upbeat thought, but it's a fact, of course, of life, of nature. So he's implying that we're all temporary. We're all here just for a while. And then he wants people to focus on while we're here, what is important. Well, this is about someone having some kind of a crisis or some kind of a, you know, a, a, challenge, if you want to say that, or crisis, we don't know what, and I don't think he ever said, that he needs to give deep, intense thought to, of course, that's why it's called, the French name of it is in French, exactly the same, the thinker, 
It's his most famous sculpture. It's the copies of it are, that he made himself are all over the world. There's one at the Stanford Art Museum. It's called the Cantor. And some of you know if you've been there on the Stanford campus. Oh, there are some in New York, there's some in Chicago, almost every big city in the US and uh, Western Europe with a big art museum or uh, you know, collection of sculpture has one. He made many of them, but the original was this one in Paris. Now he also got an estate. There's a the last fact about the meaning of this slide. And we have one more, um, is that he was given four acres in the middle of Paris that is extremely valuable real estate, even back then. In the late 1800s, I don't remember when, but after he was already famous, again, the French government supporting their own most successful artist. So he never had to worry again about mortgages and rent and all that. He could focus on his work. And that is now open to the public as the Rodin Museum. It's in the left bank of Paris. And it has the originals of almost all his most famous sculpture. Well, the other one that's equally famous, we're gonna have to skip these, I wish we had more time, is this one, our last must know, The Kiss, I already spelled his name, 1898. He worked mostly in uh, bronze, but he did do some marble as all classical, uh, you know, let's say classically trained sculptors would have learned. So here he uses realism on the bodies. The, the, obviously it, if it's bronze, it, it would have the malleable lumps of clay, but not in marble. So that's not the same, but otherwise the rough base that focuses supposedly us on the, our attention, let's say, on the fact that these figures are just like the, all of us going to someday go back into the earth from which we all came, you know. It's a phrase from the, some of you know, from the Bible, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. Anyway, you could just say he emphasized our mortality with his rough base on every piece of his sculpture, marble or bronze, he always did that. And then his figures usually exemplify some intense moment of human life or experience. This is to adulterous lovers, the meaning of this. It has two meanings. On the surface, you say the main meaning, if you want to, is from a scene from Dante's Inferno. And don't ask me to spell it. It's like it sounds. Okay, D, I'm sorry. I should spell his first name since many of you haven't ever uh, written it probably. D-A-N-T-E, Dante's Inferno which is a medieval poem about hell. So these two are adulterous lovers. You don't have to know their name. I used to give it out, but we're running short on time. And they were um, going to hell for being adulterous lovers. They were both married to other people. So that's a sin. But there's another meaning. What's going on with his thumb? His thumb is raised. Why would he be thinking something outside of the passion that he is sharing with this uh, lover of his because it's a self uh, let's call it it's a mea culpa there we go it's a mea culpa of Rodan himself because he had an affair with one of his assistants who was like in her early 20s and he was in his mid 50s when he was world famous and it lasted for 15 years and he kept saying he'd marry her and of course he was already married and so he never did, of course, and she never got over it. Her name was Camille Claudel. She became a very famous sculptor in her own right. And he didn't really teach her anything. He critiqued her early work when she just was an assistant, but they, they were mutually attracted, but she resisted him, obviously. She knew that wasn't gonna be good for her, but eventually she gave in and he's admitting that he was the aggressor. But last fact about the meaning, he's implying Oh, but at least I was hesitant. At least I thought about it. Well, actually, that's not true. She was the one that resisted him for over a year. And so it's his sort of, you know, unrealistic or inaccurate way of saying, I know I you know, shouldn't have involved myself in that relationship because it was, oh, it was a scandal. Anyone in France who was interested in the arts in general, not just sculpture, would, knew about that. What, he, what happened with the two of them. So he went on to continue being famous and her career never did quite uh, reach the level of success that he did. Although she did sell her work and had it exhibited in museums. Then there's another movie about the life of an artist, Camille Claudel. It's literally, a t we don't have time for me to spell, Camille Claudel, the, the two words, her name. It's a brilliant movie with Gerard Depardieu as Rodin and he plays that role brilliantly. Okay, formal analysis. They're balanced totally. He's the largest mass, or is it the base? You decide, it's a close call. Maybe it's the base, then him, then her, that's it. For space, it's three-dimensional. It's just overlapping is the only technique. 
and the rest into real space. It's dynamic. I don't see anything stable about it, except maybe his upper body, yeah, just his chest or his upper arm, <laughs> but everything else is a diagonal. And then there is carved line here on their faces. If you walk around it like I did in that museum where it's displayed, he put this here in this position to uh, set the light on it naturally. So the modeling is part of his design to set it in a room and the place near a window where the light would create these shadows. So it is part of his intention. And the lines are carved, of course, on their faces, their feet and hands and the face. It's completely balanced. Um, and let's see, I forget, oh, color is a cool color. And the semi texture here is realistic on their skin, uh, hair, uh, and then of course the rock. Um, and then uh, I think that's it, right? Have I missed anything? Modeling, I don't think so. So uh, I, some of you know, real quick, 60 seconds, okay. Uh, Andrew McCarthy from the Brat Pack. There's even a play about that group of actors, including uh, Demi Moore and that whole generation of Gen Xers, right? That were really famous with movies like, you know, 16 Candles and I don't remember, um, St. Elmo's Fire. Anyway, he starred in many movies. And I saw him incognito, in disguise in Paris three times when I was there taking these slides in front of the Musée d'Orsay, right? we already said what that is last lecture, inside the Louvre, and then coming out of this museum. So when I saw him the third time, I said, excuse me, aren't you Andrew McCarthy? And he said, okay, you caught me. I was trying to hide out. He had several days go with a beard and dark sunglasses and a trench coat, and he's with his Italian model girlfriend. So I said, no, I don't want your autograph. That's not why I teach art history at a college in uh, Santa Rosa. And he said, yes, so what is your question? I said, I've seen you at three of the best museums in Paris. Which one did you like best? And he said, this one. I was surprised. I asked, well, really? I would have thought you'd say the Louvre. He goes, no, I can tell you why, too. Because until I saw some of these sculptures, Rodin sculptures, I never realized stone could be so erotic. That's a quote. He gave me permission to quote him. So there's a little vignette for you. Okay, I'm going to stick around if you have questions, but I do have to get to my other classroom where I have to set up in the next few minutes. Okay, thank you. So stopping the share, any questions that are urgent, uh, of course, I will follow up with uh, in emails as well. Uh, by tomorrow when I get to check my email again. Anybody have Mark, an art question? Yes. Mark, I have one quick question. On the last sculpture you just showed us, the sculpture, um, the modeling, there wouldn't be modeling in the statue. No. The modeling would be natural no, but, light on the statue, But, but right? created by the artist. You got why, right? I explained that. That is a part of the composition in that he never, that hasn't been moved. That sculpture has been sitting in the exact spot where he placed it while he was alive. And it's in his will that they had okay. to it there. Okay, because the you. light hits it during the time that the museum is open or middle of the day, you know, when most people would see it. Uh, of course it varies, you know, obviously by the end of the afternoon in the winter, there isn't as much shadow, but he wanted people to see it with certain type of shadows on it. Okay, any other questions? Anybody else? That was just what I wanted to ask too, that I didn't realize that he really placed all of those there, but right where no, he wanted just to. Just that one. I don't, oh. maybe he did that with others, but just that one is the only one I'm sure of, that piece mm -hmm. to kiss. The others are scattered on the ground. I mean, it's four acres, so you, it's a one. I know it's beautiful. I've, I've seen it. The, the yes. Gates of Hell was my favorite. Yeah, actually. well, that is, I meant to say, but we, I've already stopped uh, you yeah. know, the lecture, so I'll just say, that is why he did the thinker and the, the kiss because there were going to be several figures on a group of figures on a gateway and no one knows for sure whether that gateway was for a housing development, a public plaza, a private estate or a cemetery. That's where I would think it would fit called the gates of hell. It was never built. The gate itself was never finished and those sculptures stayed in his studio because they weren't used for this outdoor yeah. setting, but it was called the gates of hell. So you could yeah. have that as part of the meaning if you want to add that to your notes. You're right, that's in the phrase. And he was very excited because it was multiple commissions you know, from one client, but I guess the client paid him a kill fee or something for the ones he didn't do, but he, he got paid for those, but he loved them so much. And since they weren't gonna be used, he kept them. And they became his two most famous pieces with copies of them all over the world, especially the thinker. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, okay, I think what we'll do now is say, don't forget, there's no class 
on uh, Wednesday, but your papers are due by midnight on Monday, and I will send you a reminder plus the cover sheet, and then I will show you. I don't need to do it now. We've done it already on Monday. The format to remind you to send it to Mark W at AOL as a PDF. Okay. All right. You thank guys? you. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. Weekend. Thanks. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I got to get there.